Welcome to Grace this weekend. Thanks for being here with us. If uh, you're here in the room, thanks for showing up today. Of course, if you're tuning in online, thanks for doing that as well. And if you've just started coming, maybe in the last handful of weeks here, good chance we haven't met yet. I'd love to meet you. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, one of the teaching pastors. And so maybe afterwards, say hi real quick, maybe introduce yourself. And I'd love to hear how you made your way to Grace. And we have been in this series over the last bunch of weeks now called God and Money. And we said we're going to dive into a conversation all about money, mainly because Jesus did. All right. When Jesus walked the earth and when he taught, he would spend quite a bit of time talking about the subject of finances, of our money. And I think there's some really good reasons for that, uh, because money is going to occupy quite a bit of mental space in our lives. Right? When we think about our dreams, we think about our future, uh, we think about what we intend or hope for in life, often those dreams are going to have a price tag attached to them. There's going to be a financial aspect to chasing down whatever it is we want out of life. And of course, money is going to affect our relationships, uh, whether it's our marital relationship, our interaction with our parents or our children, our siblings, right? our, our bosses, our employer-employee relationship, no matter what, money is going to show up all over the place, and it has a huge impact on our lives. And so we said we need to spend some time kind of looking at it from God's perspective. What is money all about? How does it work, and how does it affect us? And we said we, we understand that money, when Jesus talks about it, he's going to call our attention to it for one big reason is that it's probably the leading indicator, the leading temptation we would have to put our trust in something other than God, especially in our day and age where it's not a trade-based society, where we're going to consolidate kind of all of our income down to a currency. We're going to think, I want to think of money when I think about my hopes and my dreams and my future. It's just natural for us to do that. So Jesus is going to point us to that and say, listen, you're always going to be tempted to worship or to put your hope in money. When it comes down to trusting God or just kind of taking the money, we said it's always going to be a temptation just to take the money and run, just to go with it. All right? But we looked over the last handful of weeks um, on some conversations already. If you missed any of those online, I encourage you to catch up. You can do that at graceohio.org. Watch or listen to those for free, or of course, our YouTube channel, you can watch those there, subscribe as well. But here's kind of what we talked about in a nutshell. Uh, we talked about money and how to view it a little bit from God's perspective. And here's one of the first things that we laid down as kind of a premise to work off of. We said, money is not evil, it's just dangerous, right? Money is not evil, it's just dangerous. So money in and of itself has no morality to it. It's not good or bad, it's just a very dangerous thing. And the reason why it's dangerous is because when I have money, and probably the more I have it, the more this is true, it magnifies my character, right? It magnifies what's going on inside of my heart. That's a dangerous thing, right? Because what are my actual motivations for money? What do I want to do with it? And what do I think that it's going to be used for? So it's not evil, it's just dangerous. That was kind of the first premise that we laid down. We advanced the conversation further, and we said when we're thinking about money and thinking about it in the context of life, money doesn't work like this. It doesn't work like, hey, I want to gain as much money as I can, and whoever gets the most money wins. Right? We said money is not a trophy, it's a tool. Money is not a trophy, it's a tool. Right? It's something that's to be put into practice and put into use. It's to be utilized. It's to be maximized. It's not something that I try to kind of gather up and hoard for myself, and if I have the most toys or the most money or the most net worth, then I win life. It's not how money is to be viewed. It's a tool. It's just a dangerous tool, and I want to understand how God would use it. That leads us to kind of our next premise that we built off of just last weekend. We, we said money's not an economic currency. Money's a relational currency, when we look at money from God's perspective, the primary use that God would kind of point us to when it comes to our money is to build relationships with it, to use it to be generous and to share and to kind of build credibility and open doors relationally with our money. Right, what we want to do today is kind of build off of where we've already been going and advance the conversation one step further. We want to have a conversation about 
generosity and how if we keep going down this road, where does it lead us when we really put our money into use? And where are we aiming when we look at money? How do we get the most out of it? Here's the premise we're going to work off of today. We said this, money's highest returns don't come from getting, they come from giving. Money's highest returns don't come from getting, they come from giving. At the end of the day, if I want to maximize the impact of money in my own life and in my experience, it's not going to have the highest return from kind of gathering for myself. It's actually going to be giving it away. And I want us to see these two verses that have really blown my mind over the last probably couple decades since I've come to know Jesus. Right? I had no Christian background, met Jesus as a young adult, and began to learn the Bible. And these two verses, which we're going to look at in just a second, struck me right away because they're so countercultural. The message that Jesus would have about our finances is so different than what we would hear today. And I'll show you one of them as we jump into the conversation. Here's what Jesus would say in the book of Acts. He says this, it's more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Let's unpack that a little bit. Profound statement. Jesus is going to say, if you want to be blessed, that word basically means to be congratulated, right? Congratulations. If you want to have the good life, a life that is worthy of congratulations, Jesus is going to say, the best place to find that is to be in a place where you're a giver even more than you are a receiver. Now, let me talk to this for a minute because we're all going to be receivers when it comes to money. There's no getting around it. Uh, we're going to end up receiving from our parents. We come into the world and have to be provided for. There's a reality to that there's nothing wrong with being a receiver, right? There's not, right, nothing wrong with having my needs met physically in this life. All of us would have that be true of us, and many of us, even into adulthood, would be receivers financially or of opportunities or of people kind of helping us out along the way. Nothing wrong with receiving. And I would even go so far as to say, um, if you're unable to receive, something's probably a little bit wrong on the inside, right? There's probably something a little bit off. I remember I felt like this when I came into following Jesus, uh, the gifts that I had received before coming to know Christ often had a lot of strings attached to them, you know? And so I was real hesitant to receive from anybody. I wanted to make my own way because if I take from you, I think I know what that means. I think that means you really are going to make me owe you one if I take something, if I receive from you as a gift that's just genuinely giving for my benefit, right? And as an act of your pleasures, you have blessed me. I need to be in a place where I'm able to receive, right? I want to have the humility to be in that and to recognize it. But then Jesus is going to go another step further. He's saying, certainly you have received, but boy, if you really want the good stuff, if you want the good life, that is to be in a place where you are a giver, to be in the seat of the giver where you get to bless others. That's where the good stuff is. And this is so counterculture, so interesting to look at this verse because even when we talk about being blessed, we're going to use it often in the context of receiving, right? I, I'm, I'm so blessed. I got a new car or I got a new house. God has blessed me. And that's true. Jesus would just take it to the next level and say, hey, if you really want to be in this different kind of experience of life, if you want to enjoy life the way that I've designed it to be, you should look towards giving. That's the highest return. That's where the good stuff is. And there's a reason for that. We want to continue to take what we just talked about here and advance it and connect it to this next verse I want us to look at, right? So it's more blessed to give than to receive. Then here's a verse we looked at a few weeks ago. Jesus also says this about money. He says, for where your treasure is, right, where your money is, there your heart will be also. Often we're going to use that verse or view that verse in a descriptive lens. Here's what I mean by that. We're going to describe what happens when we put our money somewhere. We're going to say, if you want to know where your heart is, go look and see where your money went, and then you're going to find your heart there as well. Right? It's descriptive. However, the way Jesus talks about it here is also prescriptive. Here's what I mean. If I want my heart to move, I can move it by moving my money. Jesus is saying, hey, you, you want to have a different kind of passion? You want to have a passion for people or a passion for the kingdom of God? 
then move your money, invest your treasure there, and your heart's going to follow it. Always that's going to be true. When I invest myself into something, I'm always going to care about that at a different level when I put money on it. When I invest in it, when I pay for something, I care about it at a different level. We all know that's how it works. Just this last few weeks, I actually, I redid my roof uh, with a couple buddies. There's like one guy who knew what he was doing, and then there's like the rest of us, and we just did what we were told. And uh, I spent a whole lot of hours on my roof. And it was fascinating as I spent a ton of time working on my roof and redoing it. What happened was, as we redid this thing, is now when I look at houses, do you know what I see? I see roofs. You all knew that, didn't you? Right? Why? Because all of a sudden I care about roofs. You know how this goes? When you buy a new car, you see that car everywhere. Right? It's just how it works. If you, if you invest in a stock, all of a sudden you care about that company. You pay attention to it at a different level. Right? When I invest in something, when I put my money on something, my heart and my affection is going to follow it no matter what. Now, there's a reason for that. If we look behind the scenes on how this works and kind of break it down, here's what I think happens. We spend an enormous amount of our lives, a huge portion of our lives focused around money. We kind of just have to, right? So we're going to spend a lot of our lives making money. And before that, we're going to spend a lot of our lives preparing to have an opportunity where I might be able to have a job so that I can make money. Right? And then once I have a little bit of money, I'm going to have to manage that money to make sure it goes as far as it can. Right? So when we look at our lives, and a huge portion of our lives is going to be spent on the pursuit, the management, the production, the creation of money. There's nothing really even wrong with that. It's just kind of a fact. But what happens then is where that money then goes where the direction of that money lands is going to start to matter a lot. That's why we care about our money a ton. Because at the end of the day, the answer to that question, where is my money going, is really at its root an extension of answering the question, where is my life going? Where I invest my money is an extension of actually where I invest my life, a good portion of it at least. Because I'm trading my life and my time to make my money, and now once I have some money, I'm going to put it somewhere, and ultimately, one big extension or expression of my life is going to show up through how I spend my money, right? How I invest my finances. Jesus knows that. That's why my treasure and my money are always going to be connected, right? My treasure and my heart are always going to be connected because my life is actually going to be connected to that outcome. The question then becomes, for all of us, is this, how do I act in such a way that I'm operating in financial wisdom, right? Because I think zero of us, none of us, want to give our lives to nothing. No one's interested in having zero impact on the planet or living a life that doesn't matter at all. We all want to have some kind of impact. We want our lives to count for something, the question is, how do I do that? How do I find wisdom and act on that and put it into practice? Here's what I put in your notes. I said, we're exercising financial wisdom when our money decisions match God's priorities. Right? When our money decisions match God's priorities. At the end of the day, God loves us. right? And what he wants for us is he wants us to be able to live in a place of financial wisdom. And God, I believe, he wants us to enjoy the privilege that he gets to operate in all the time as a giver. Think about this for a second. God constantly gives. He ever lives to give himself away. He's constantly meeting needs. He's giving to the righteous and the unrighteous. He's providing food and shelter and opportunities. And he has given financially. He's given relationships. He's even given to the point of giving his own son. The very nature of who God is, is he is love. And because he is love, he is going to give himself away. 
Now, here's the thing. He wants us to experience the kind of love and the kind of joy that he gets to experience because that's where the good stuff is, right? That, that's where the joy is, the blessing is. I was thinking about this uh, even for kind of for my kids because I've got four kids that are between 6 and 11, and we talk about money a lot, right? We just kind of on, on happenstance end up doing that. We talk about not spending money on accident, right? A lot of times when we're walking through the grocery line store, I don't know if you've noticed this, but there's an enormous amount of candy right there, right? There's gum and candy, and all of a sudden it becomes extraordinarily attractive for children to buy that or grab it and ask you or me to buy it when we're going through there. And we talk about this law that the roadmans have that we never buy candy from that aisle. We can make a purposeful trip to go buy candy from the store, but we will not buy it when we're going through the checkout line ever, right? Because we're neurotic and it's an issue, right? Whatever. But we talk about that. Why? Because we want to control and and have our spending be on purpose. Listen, I want my kids to do that. I want them to understand self-control. I want them to be able to spend their money on purpose. I want them to be able to save for a goal and be able to like do that and have the self-control to understand it, to understand to say no to myself today so I can say yes later. But you know what I really, really, really want for my kids? What I really want for them to understand and to experience is the joy of giving. I want them not only to understand the joy of receiving, and understand how to manage money for themselves. Well, that's a good goal. I want them to go beyond that and experience what it's like to enjoy the kind of joy that God gets to have when he gives. That's awesome. That's the good stuff right there. And I want them to be able to have it, right? When they take a piece of their heart, right, which is connected to their treasure, and they invest it outward, they're experiencing the kind of life that Jesus would say, that's blessed right there. That's the good stuff. And I want you to have it more and more and more. And here's the reason why. At the end of the day, when we look at our money decisions and God's priorities, right, he would want us to have all that stuff set up. We should take care of the people in our lives. If you're a dad, you should absolutely provide for your home and you should save money and you should have a roof over your head. You should do all those things. God would celebrate that. Even having times of celebration where we uh, get to, Go on vacation and celebrate anniversary. It's all good stuff. God would love that and he would appreciate that. And he would also want us to put our hearts and invest them into people. People are a huge priority in God's eyes. Here's what I said in your notes. People are always the most valuable things in the room. People are always the most valuable things in the room. In any given room, at any given time, I don't care what it is, If you have a Nobel Peace Prize in that room, if you have stacks of cash in that room, right? if you have degrees upon degrees, bachelor's, master's, PhDs, if you have gold bars to the ceiling, right? if you have silver, if you have Bitcoin, whatever that is, right? Like, (laughs) it doesn't matter what's in that room. If there's a human being in that room, The human being is always the most valuable thing. Always. That's true for you and I, that we would be that valuable to God. It would be true of our kids, of our friends, our neighbors. It would even be true of our enemies. That's true because humans, people, are the only things that are made in the image of God. Right? We are the only ones that Jesus would come and die for and offer his life for. We are the only ones that have the opportunity to be redeemed and to spend eternity with God in heaven. People are eternal. Man, you guys, this is why when Jesus is more blessed to give than to receive, if you move your treasure there, your heart's gonna follow that. You wanna give yourself to people Because people are eternal. Think about that for a second. People are eternal. We are souls, and we're going to live forever somewhere, either in the presence of God or separated from God, but we're going to live somewhere. And when we give ourselves to people, we're giving to something that is eternal, something that it will last. It's massive when you begin to think about it. 
I feel like this is such a profound thing because for my whole life, before I came to know Jesus, I believed that the best life you could have was just to live for yourself, to accumulate as much as you could, to spend on yourself, to live your dreams. That's kind of a lot, a lot of ways, that's a message of our culture. So it's so radical to look at this from a different lens and see it from Jesus' perspective. When he would say, listen, a life aimed at giving is gonna be the good life rather than the life aimed at getting. And you might say, Ryan, what's this look like? If you played it out for me a little bit, show me what this looks like. We'll, We'll look at what Paul says because he's gonna lean into this. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. Stop here for a minute. I don't know how you feel when you read this verse. It's hard for me to think of myself as rich. It's hard for me to do that. It's hard for me to think, yeah, I'm in that category. I bet it's hard for you as well. It's hard for me to think of that I'm someone who's wealthy, but at the end of the day, by, by any category, by any standard, right, if we have indoor plumbing and we have some kind of residence to live in with a roof over our head, if we have food to eat, if we have a car to drive, if we have a couple pairs of clothes and a pair of shoes to put on, by any definition, we are in the top percentage of all human beings materially on the planet today. And then certainly that would be true over the generations of all human history, that we would be among the most wealthy people ever. Paul would look and say, listen, you who are rich, he would look at Timothy and say, here's how you should instruct them. Command those who are rich in this present world, me, you, us, not to be arrogant, not to believe that we created this, that we came up with this wealth on our own or to put their hope in that wealth, which is so uncertain, right? It can't be trusted, but to put their hope in God. God is the one who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Think of it like a father, right? God gives us material blessing. He provides for us so that we can provide for our own needs and the needs of those we're entrusted with, and so we can give and experience the joy of giving to the people around us, right? There's more reasons that, but those are certainly central. But God enjoys giving to his children, and he wants us to be able to enjoy that blessing as well. He says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and to be willing to share. Invest yourself into people, Paul would say here. He says, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Right? You'd say, listen, you're, you're rich. That's okay. It's not sinful. It's not wrong. God is never going to condemn someone for either having or making a certain amount of money. It's how I view it, and it's what I do with it that God would be concerned about. He would say, listen, I gave this to you for your enjoyment, don't, don't be arrogant. Be quick to share. Be quick to give to people. Be generous. Love people. Give your heart to them. Move your money towards them and your heart is gonna follow, right? And we say, what would this look like over a lifestyle if I continue to, to go down this road? If I looked at a life aimed at getting versus a life aimed at giving, In this life, there's ramifications, and then certainly there's ramifications for the next life. And I'm gonna talk to this from a distinctly Christian point of view, right? So if you're a Christ follower, this is gonna be in that context. If you're investigating being a Christ follower, here's kind of what we believe about how all this works. And let me say this even before we dive into it. Giving and getting have nothing to do with salvation. I cannot give my way into heaven, We don't get right with God by our behavior. We get right with God by our belief. It's who we trust is how we become right with God, right? So it's because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. That's how I'm right with God today, not because of any actions or behaviors I've performed, right? But say, Ryan, what, what would it look like? A life aimed at getting, how does that play out in this life 
And then of a life of giving, how does it play out in this life as well? Here's the first one, right? I, in this life, what do I get from focusing myself, aiming at being kind of a getter, right? Where I'm trying to grab onto all this life has to give me financially. Well, in this life, I can get some stuff, right? And you might, man, you might be stuff guy. Like you just might love you some stuff, you, you might collect some stuff and you love it. You want toys, right, and gadgets and just want to grab a bunch of stuff. And, and when, maybe you're a lady that likes stuff. Like your closet is full of shoes and stuff and clothes. And you're like, man, I just love some. And that's your, kind of your natural bent. Maybe, right? Maybe you're, maybe you're experiences person. You're like, you know what? I hate stuff. I don't want any stuff. I want to live in a tiny house and go travel the world. It's going to be amazing, right? I want to do, I want to do the FIRE plan, financial independence, retirement early, right? I want to go travel the world, and I want to go have all the experiences. It's going to be amazing. I want to, I've got my bucket list is a half a mile long, and I just want to, you know, do the whole experiences thing to death. You might be the comfort person. I just want to live a comfortable life. I just want to be comfortable, I, I just want to live a normal, happy-ish, kind of North American, don't mess with me, I have no enemies, nothing hurts ever kind of life, right? Jeez, I just want to be comfortable. Hey, and guess what? There's nothing inherently wrong with stuff or with experiences or with comfort. And in some measure, probably we're all going to have some of those. That's fine. When I aim my life at those things, what do I get from it, though? That's the question. At the end of the day, it's basically a temporary enjoyment, right? There's good, that new car smell and experience only lasts just a little bit, right? The millisecond that my iPhone goes faster than my old iPhone, it just lasts just a little bit, and then it's pretty much just like my old one, right? The new stuff and the thrill that I get from having it, that's the whole reward. It's the whole return on investment for my money that I invested into that. Just what it is. I might get a memory, right? Is it good to go on vacation? Absolutely. If I live on vacation, is that really a life worth living? Right? It's different. It's like only eating dessert all the time. Right? It, it's meant to have its rightful place. Those do not last or equate to anything. And of course, comfort is going to fade. I've, I've kind of had my whole return on my investment, a temporary thrill, a temporary enjoyment. Now, play it out. What happens when I aim at giving? What, what do I get from this life? Oh, man, heart move towards people. Heart move towards people. Anybody that's gone down the road of trying to get for yourself, everybody knows this, that in a life aimed at me all the time cannot lead to a truly joyful, satisfying life, that I have to have an outward focus. We all know that. Right? And, and when I give, when I focus on others, when I give to needs and care for the poor and invest in the kingdom, what happens is I'm taking a, a part of my heart and rather than doubling down on some me, I'm investing it outward. And I'm caring about people and seeing them with compassion in a way that I wouldn't otherwise do. Right? What happens as I do that is my life is changed. Nothing, you want to change your life, nothing will change you more than focusing and aiming at being a giver, aiming yourself at generosity. Because inevitably, as I take my treasure and move it towards needs and move it towards compassion and move it towards God's priorities more and more, my heart's going to move towards those things. And I'm going to see like Jesus more and more and more. The people are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And my life is changed through that as well, right? And then I'm gonna see lives changed. There are few things as rewarding as being able to look at the return on my investment of my finances and see that that person was affected because, just because I gave a little bit of money. That their life is changed or maybe their marriage is saved, that's unbelievable, right? And there's a lasting joy that, that comes from that. And when I put it on the scale, when I look and say, this new shiny thing, which I can have, or, or this kid is scholarship through game day and their life is changed by it, there's no contest. 
right? Am I ever going to regret that decision? I wish I would have gave a little bit less to that needy kid, right? Like nobody ever says that. We're always excited and feel great about that decision because we know it's eternal. There's a lasting joy that comes from aiming our lives giving. So, right, what happens in the next life, right? Because if this life is all that there is, I can see how you land on the premise that we should probably just try to have as much fun as we can before we get out of it. I understand that. But, it, but if I believe that there's a God, and if I believe that there is a heaven, I believe that there's a, a hell, right? I believe all that, I need to, to put in the equation the long-term implications of eternity, Right? If, if I think in terms of having a long-range plan and eternity is not a part of that plan, I'm kind of fooling myself because right? it's reality. A life aimed at getting in the next life, what do I get from that? At the end of the day, of course, I'm going to suffer some loss. I'm going to suffer some loss, right? Because I can't take it with me. You want to hear a fascinating thought that just rocks me personally? When we leave this life, there's literally nothing that we can take with us from here to the next life. Not one article of clothing, not one material possession, not one bank account. There's no transfer. I literally am gonna leave everything that I have in this life when I go to the next one. Like, as I was working that through this week, that was jarring to me. Like, oh, oh, yeah. It, it's all going to go away. This life is temporary. And I need personally a reminder of that. Right, look, look at this verse in Ecclesiastes. It says, everyone comes naked from their mother's womb. And as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. None of it's going to move forward. Right? So everything that I have, if I've invested and doubled down on this life, or my stuff, or my experiences, or my comfort, or whatever, and I've amassed for myself only for the sake of getting, not with an intentional plan to give it away or pass it forward in some way, then what's happened is I'm going to suffer an enormous amount of loss when I go from this life to the next because my heart is invested deeply here in this world. I think another thing that's going to happen is I'm going to see opportunity cost. A lot of times investors will talk this way that, that there's a cost to an opportunity that's missed. Right? And when we see Jesus face to face, there's going to be a lot of math that's done that I don't even, I don't totally understand. But here's what I know. All kinds of things are going to make sense when I leave this life and go to the next one and stand before Jesus. I don't know how that's going to play out, but I know that a lot of things are going to get clear real quick. And I think one of the things that's going to happen for us is we're going to be able to see the opportunities that we could have jumped in on with our money or with our lives or with risks we could have taken in this life. And instead, maybe we made these decisions that were lesser. They weren't necessarily sinful or wrong. We just missed the opportunity to have a huge impact. The cost between what we did and what we could have done. We're going to see that reality, I believe. And then Jesus will wipe away every tear from our eye, and it'll be okay, right? For the Christ follower, that's going to be true. Because we know what happens when somebody says yes to Jesus. Of course, we don't go to heaven based on what we do, but what we believe. But we are rewarded in heaven, in eternity, when we stand before Jesus based on our acts of faith, based on how we interacted with Jesus and put our faith in his words, a reality to that, right? When I look at what happens with a life aimed at giving, it's going to be the opposite. There's going to be eternal rewards for the follower of Jesus. And let me just say this, that's going to matter in a way that I cannot fathom today. 
If you ever made a really great financial decision and down the road you're like, man, I'm glad I did that. It was painful in the moment, but I'm sure glad I said no to myself back here so I could do this later. If you ever had that experience, take that and multiply it by a thousand, by infinity. And that's something of what we'll experience there. We're going to look and say, I'm so glad I doubled down on giving, on investing into people, on acting on the words that Jesus has spoken. When we see him, we'll be rewarded for that. I don't know how it's going to work or how it's going to look, but I think it's going to be amazing. And we're going to be commended by Jesus. How's this going to look, Ryan? That's a great question. I wish I totally had the answer, but we get these glimpses in Scripture, but there's not a full snapshot. Sometimes I like to imagine it, though, right, that, that one day we're going to stand in front of Jesus and probably stand in front of all created humanity, and Jesus is going to say something to us about how we've lived. And all I know is that when that happens, that's going to be the only thing that matters in the summation of my entire life are the words that he has to say. And hear me loud and clear. It's not for salvation. But I want to look at Jesus and hear him say, I'm proud of your faith. You, you, did, you leveraged all that you had for my kingdom. You, you leaned into it. You gave yourself away. You were generous. You did it. Well done. We're going to long to hear those words. And, and at the end of the day, some of us are going to hear that, and some of us are going to hear, you know, you're here. <laughs> and I'm not sure how that works. All I know is that Jesus wants us to know by his teaching that we're going to care a lot about how we lived when we show up and see him face to face. It's going to matter a lot, right? So when I look at a life aimed at giving, I change. I see lives change. I walk away with joy and a peace of knowing that I'm living God's priorities and knowing that in the future, the actual the big rewards of seeing Jesus and sharing in his joy is all coming. What, what an awesome place to live. And you might say, Ryan, how's this going to look? Like, what, what could this look like today? In intentional decisions being made, how does this all play out? One of the things I love about the role I get to play here at Grace is this, that people will sometimes want to do some generous things for other people, right? And this happens all the time. There, there will be somebody every handful of months or every year that comes up to me and they have a huge smile on their face and they're so excited because they know about a need in someone's life that they love that's here at the church and they want to facilitate a generosity to them, but they know, man, if I gave it right to them, they probably wouldn't take it or it would be misunderstood, so they want to give it anonymously. And so they're so excited to, to give a gift to somebody and to watch this need get met. And so they've exercised all this creativity and strategy to utilize this person and this life group leader to help this gift land its way into this person's lap, and they're so fired up about it. Why? Because their life is aimed at giving, they're focused on trying to give themselves away and move their energy that way. I, I heard about a lady last Christmas. This is amazing. It's so simple. What she did is she, she took like 100 bucks and she made 20 little $5 gift bags. So simple, right? Put a little tiny gift card for $5 or whatever and put some chapstick in it and a little note card. And what she did is when she went around and did her Christmas shopping, she took the little bag, and, and every time she checked out, she just gave this gift to somebody at the drive through or at Lowe's or at wherever she is. And she said people were absolutely blown away by it. The fact that you would stop and give me a gift and think about me and show this kindness to me when I didn't do anything to deserve it, that act of generosity was mind-blowing. I was talking to this lady about She said, one lady just started bawling over five bucks, right? Is it really about five bucks? It was about the act of kindness. She started bawling 
And she said, you have no idea how much I needed this. Oh my goodness. These little decisions along the way where I can take my resources that God's entrusted to me and I can enjoy the blessing of watching someone else be blown away by generosity. What if we did this kind of stuff? What if we strategized and were creative and worked on giving like we worked on saving or like we worked on spending or we worked on making more money? What kind of fun could we have with that? It'd be amazing. What what if this turned into more than just some intentional decisions, but it brewed into an actual like intentional plan? See, because here's the thing, that this has to go beyond just random acts of kindness. If this thing is informed by our faith, that's a different animal, right? We're not not talking about just paying it forward. We're talking about an eternal perspective on our finances, right? We we would look and say, we want to give deeply because Jesus gave completely. How do I dive that down a layer deeper? Here's what I'd say. We, We need an intentional plan for our money so we can build an intentional habit of generosity. And what if we looked at our entire financial life and said, Man, I, Lord, I want to aim this thing at, at giving because I believe your words. It's more blessed to give than to receive. What, what if instead of paying 18 or 22% to Visa, we paid that off, didn't go back into debt, and then we had all that extra to go play with in being generous? Do, you, do we think that would lead to more joy? Guaranteed it would. Right? What, what if instead of letting those student loans linger and languish out there forever, we attacked that to grab that piece back into our financial plan so I could be generous with it? What if instead of the new car, I just drove the old one a little bit longer? Right? Why? So I could take that extra money and throw it into the kingdom and throw it at, at people who Jesus loves and who he died for and I can watch lives be changed. Could it be possible that that's actually the key to the most joy in this life that we could find financially? It's possible. It's just a question. It's what Jesus said. He said, man, it's a place of blessing. As I will look at you and tell you all day, I have been wrestling with this verse as a North American for the last 15 to 20 years, and I'm starting to believe it. I'm not totally there. (laughs) I want to believe it more and more. I want to live there, right? Because I believe it's exciting, and I'm starting to see it more and more as I live. So, Ryan, what are some things we can do to walk away from this conversation? Or some, maybe some questions that we can ask. Here's some questions that you might wrestle with that I've certainly been wrestling with this week, looking to have this conversation with you. I'm looking at asking, I want to ask the question, do, do I have an intentional plan for, for the money that God's entrusted me with? I, today, if I looked at my whole financial landscape, do I know where it is? Is it sloppy? Is it, a mess? Is it just kind of functional and happening? Or, or am I exercising kind of strategy and planning and intentionality over it? It's the first question I might ask. Am I managing my money, in essence? Here's the follow-up to that question. What end, if I am, am I managing that money towards? Where is it aimed at? Is it aimed in such a way that I want to be a person who's a giver or am I just looking to get and I believe that life is found in in more and more and more for me? Right? There's nothing wrong with enjoying a little bit, celebrating. I want to say that. But what's the aim of my life? Is it about the kingdom or do I believe that I got to get it all now because life is short, you only live once, have it all now. I'd say that is a huge, deep question if we're going to be honest with ourselves. And it's a question not really about our mind. It's a question about our faith. What do I believe about life, about money, and where real joy is found? 
And he, here's the final question I'd ask. I've been wrestling with this one for the last probably four years. Do I really understand how much I've been given? And it blows my mind how generous God has been. Think, think about how generous God has been to you and to me. Financially, relationally, that God would go to such great lengths that he would give his own son. Oh my. We have so much. I have so much. We're rich in every way. And God would look back at us as his children and say, I want you to give as you have been given to. I want you to know the joy, the blessing of loving how I love. We enter into that with me. These are the questions that we wrestle with. As the band comes out, we keep wrestling that through with, with God. What do I believe about your words? Would you pray with me? Father, we want to first and foremost say thank you so much. Lord, thank you for providing our needs uh, far more than that. Lord, you, you provide what we want in abundance, beyond measure, really. You know. Lord, thank you that showing us, thank you for showing us the way to actual blessing. It's actually through being a giver more than a receiver. We never would have figured that out on our own. I wouldn't have. And Lord, I, I ask for your help personally and I ask for each of us, help us to believe that. That the good life is found in losing ourselves and losing our life and investing into people and into your kingdom. Not in accumulating for ourselves. Lord, would you give us courage? Would you give us faith? Help us to, as your word says, build a firm foundation for the coming age when we look forward to seeing you face to face. Lord, meet with us here, even now, work in our hearts and minds. It's in your name we pray, Christ.